down writing running demons, but sometimes I get forced into new projects by David Gwynn. <laughs> um, so this talk is about something I started at uh, the File System Hackathon in Stockholm. It's iSCSI-D, um, uh, iSCSI Initiator for OpenBSD, so done the OpenBSD way. So um, this is more or less what I try to cover. Um, I try to have a quick glance at iSCSI, what it is. It's not an Apple application. Um, <laughs> I will talk about how we implemented it. This starts with vSCSI, which is our virtual SCSI controller that makes it possible that we can access the SCSI subsystem from userland. And iSCSI D, the work in progress that uh, I'm currently hacking on when I have free time. So iSCSI is SCSI over the internet. Um, it's based on mainly one RFC, but normally they come in two. So it's RFC 3720 and 3721. Um, the, the big thing is in the 3720. Uh, 3721 is more like how to detect disks and stuff like that. It's fairly simple. But, um, the idea behind it was that uh, people were searching for cheaper ways to attach their storage to boxes, uh, especially their storage area networks, um, because fiber channel is way too expensive. As some Canadian guy would say, it's just a $4,000 uh, four SCSI cable. That's fiber channel. So um, the idea behind this, you should reuse the already available network infrastructure you have in your you know, like data center and hope for the best that everything works. Um, it is disk storage, it's block access, it's not a file, a, a network file system like NFS or SMB. Um, so what is SCSI? It's like this magical four-letter acronym that um, used everywhere, but nobody really knows what it is. It's the small computer systems interface. Oh, no. <laughs> um, it's a protocol to access IO devices, and it actually is capable of accessing very many things. Uh, it starts with disks, goes over CD-ROMs, over CD-writers, uh, tape drives, tape roboters, scanners, then like the, the enclosures of disk grades and everything. So it can access very many devices. Um, it also is defined for various physical interfaces. So it started with the old parallel SCSI um, where they have many iterations over that. Then they started with serial attached SCSI, which is SAS. Uh, we have fiber channel, which uses SCSI inside the fiber channel protocol to talk to the disks. Um, we have FireWire, which is IEEE 1394, and even like USB sticks are normally using SCSI to to um, talk to the, the the stick on your that many people are using. Um, in OpenBSD, it's even so that we're using SCSI as software emulation. Um, we're trying to move everything over to SCSI so that every disk we have is actually a, seems to be a SCSI disk but it actually is not. So um, we have AHCI, um, which is the SATA controller um, most people have in modern laptops, um, which we attach through a, a, a conversation layer, AltaSCSI, that converts SCSI commands into Alta commands and back. Um, the same thing we do with RAID controllers since a long time. Um, for us, a RAID controller just exposes SCSI disks, and this is uh, way better than, than having like seven other kind of disks attached to, to various RAID controllers, just because they have some other idea of how a disk should work. Um, so yeah, SCSI is everywhere. It starts with small stuff and goes to like the really big disk storage 
Um, it is a request, uh, request response protocol. It's normally so that you have a, a target, a disk, that is, gets messages from the initiator, which is the, the operating system at the end. Um, and um, a target can have multiple, can be subdivided. That's the so-called LUNs. Um, and uh, you can have multiple targets on a, on a bus. So it's possible to have a lot of devices connected to one single bus. Um, the initiator is sending commands, which are normally, like everybody calls them CDBs. I like. I had often conversation with other people, and they were talking about CDBs, and I was like, well, "What is this <laughs> magic sauce?" Um, they're just more or less defining what command is sent over, and um, the data included is also connected to us. So, so it's it's one transaction is combined into a CDB. Um, the communication is always initiated by the initiator um, and the targets just more or less respond. I hope this is correct. Marco? <laughs> I hope it is correct. Yes. What is that? <laughs> so iSCSI is <laughs> um, iSCSI is, is packing now the SCSI transfers into TCP streams. Um, the, the one thing is there is one session um, per LUN that you attach, so for each disk you try to attach with iSCSI, you need one session. Um, you cannot have multiple sessions at the same time to the same target, which makes sense. But at the same time it's possible to have multiple connections per session, so a session is subdivided into connections. And um, the idea, I think the idea behind there is that um, in case of an error, you have your failed connection and you open a new connection, so you need two connections to, to get over the error case. And um, it's not like not many devices actually support that you can connect multiple ties to them at the same time and issue multiple commands over the various connections at the same time to get more performance. But in the RFC, they were talking about more performance, so mm -hmm. it's just often they, they define a lot of things in the RFC that in the end nobody's actually implementing. Um, iSCSI is also doing the authentication and negotiation. <laughs> so when a connection is opened, it actually does a password exchange. It's using JAP for that, which is a little bit horrible, um, to identify who is talking to me and if, if I'm allowing it, like the target allows um, based on, on a password, if this is actually implemented. So iSCSI has uh, a state machine, and this picture, at least I think it's, it's quite funny because um, this here is where actually all the work happens. And all other states are for, this, these two states are for login, and this here is just to log out, so we need four states of eight states to log out of a system, which is just like very strange. Nobody <laughs> and nobody does, yeah. So it's it's like error recovery and and and, and error handling in iSCSI is is uh, there are multiple levels of, of, of error handling and I think almost everybody just does the very basic thing, just reopen the connection and hope for the best. The RFC wasn't long enough. Yeah. Um, by default, uh, TCP port 3260 is used, so this is a port above 1024. We don't need any special privileges to to bind to this port or to connect to it. So this is fairly easy for us then. Um, it comes with 18 message types. Again, we need about five to actually transport SCSI messages, which is the five that are used all the time. And then we have additional messages. We have eight messages that are just here to set up a session and tear it down again. So it's login, logout, text configuration messages, and task configuration messages. Um, there are 
asynchronous messages for error handling because normally um, iSCALS is also a request response protocol so um, the target is just waiting for the initiator to send a packet and it has two NOP messages so you can send an NOP and receive an NOP and know that everything is fine um, the RFC also comes with buttons um, they have a lot of buttons to define um, like how the session should operate eternally. Um, they have they have knobs for like the buffer length or how many outstanding command can there be. Like they have multiple, uh, they, they try to use sliding window algorithms in SCSI and in the end, um, I think all implementation just say we support one outstanding command and nothing more. So, um, there are a lot of buttons, but most of them are actually unused. So, um, this was more or less my short introduction to iSCSI. Um, now I will have a closer look at vSCSI, which is our virtual SCSI bus, um, or actually SCSI controller for user land. The idea behind there is that we want to expose the SCSI subsystem in our mid layer to user land. So that the user line can implement a SCSI controller. Um, the kernel passes then the SCSI commands through an IOCTL interface um, from the mid layer to user land, and user land just responds to these um, calls. The, inter uh, the interface should be very simple, um, and it actually is very simple. And, um, So it comes with these six IOCTLs. You cannot read or write on this device. Um, it's it's def vSCSI zero normally in our system. We don't have more than one. Um, the IOCTLs we have are we have one IOCTL to DQ uh, a new SCSI command that comes from the, the kernel. We have uh, an IOCTL to send down the, the competition information to the SCSI stack so that the SCSI stack can close the transaction. Um, we have two um, IOCTLs to read and write data. Um, the, the read is always looked from the, the device from the kernel side, so a read is a read from a disk, so I want to have data from user land, and uh, write is I'm pushing data to the disk uh, which is actually write data to user land. And then we have two um, IOCTLs which are actually necessary to, to be able to attach uh, devices to the this, this SCSI bus we have there. Um, this comes from the fact that vSCSI is more or less uh, auto configured on boot up and user land is not running so we have nothing running at the time and uh, it's actually at that time also probed. Um, there is no device connected to it because there is no user land command running and listening on on, on this device. So um, we have a, a method that when you open the device, you can send a, a, a request probe command down to um, to tell the system to please can you probe this address? And I think there is now something, and then the the SCSI mid layer will produce all these inquiries and, and other SCSI commands to figure out what kind of disk it is or, or if it is some other device. Um, the same thing we have uh, a detach function that we can use to detach uh, a, a SCSI or the device um, after you go probed in a clean way. The other way is just to close the, the, the device descriptor and it will just pull everything down as well. Um, here is a little bit of an example, so it more or less ha uh, uses four data structures. Um, we have the, the vSCSI death event, um, device event structure which is used for the, the probe request and the, the detach request. Um, we have the initiator to target and the target to initiator structures which have the, the, the necessary um, 
SCSI command, or at least space for the SCSI commands in them. And we have the, um, the, the data IUCTL, which is used to pass data in and out. Um, if we want to attach um, a device, we start with opening the file descriptor. I just skipped that. And then uh, we set the, the, the target and the LAN that we want to probe uh, in the event, uh, def event um, structure and send the IOCTL. And uh, after that, the, 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 the vSCSI actually comes to life and starts to sending messages to us and, and we can get forward. Um, normally, uh, every start, everything starts with an initiator to target um, command coming in. So th this is the first thing we, we do. We, we, um, we issue the IOCTL vSCSI I2T um, and uh, get the command that actually the kernel was sending to us uh, that we have to handle now. Based on that, uh, on that I2T, um, we can figure out if it is a, a read or write operation. This is the direction we have uh, in, in the I2T structure. There is a tag stored in the I2T which identifies the, the SCSI tr transaction that is moving so that uh, it would be possible to have multiple um, commands running at the same time, and we just identify them by the tags. Um, there is the data len specified, like how much data the kernel wants or wants to read or write, and based on this information, we can then issue a, a write or read operation. So this is more or less an example how a write could look like. Um, we get the tag. We we store the tag in, in the in the in the data um, structure. We we need to send in the in the data write command. We allocate the buffer so that we can get all the data into the buffer. We set how much data we want to read. Um, normally, we want just to read everything in one go, and um, we issue the IOCTL and hope for the best. It's more or less the same thing for reads. Um, in, in reads, it's it's working a little bit different because we just need we need to produce the data somewhere in user and then uh, put it then down into into the kernel. Um, then when we read or we wrote the data, we need to complete the the IO the the, the, the SCSI transaction to say that everything went good or if there was an error, we have to send some sense information back to into the the the, the kernel, and um, this is what the T two Y actually does. It just closes the the transaction with the tag ID that we got in the in the I two T beforehand. And finally, at the end, when the program finishes, we normally want to detach the device as well, which is more or less the same thing as attaching it. Um, yeah, VSCSI is not perfect. It's not the ether. <laughs> um, one big issue that I figured out is that it has a very strange view of, of how um, the I.O. happens. Uh, it has a pull interface. <coughs> And you actually have to use the pull interface because you cannot really use blocking IO on vSCSI, which is very annoying if you want to write very, very, very simple uh, applications that just like show how it actually works. You suddenly need to use pull and 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 do complex loops and stuff instead of just like saying, "Okay, get me the data. I'm doing some work, and then I'm going to sleep again because there is not like I'm sleeping on the IOCTL until new data is coming." Um, this is a little bit sad. Um, and then we need to fix the man page. There is some stuff that's currently not documented. And uh, I just figured it out when I was writing the slides that some that, that the request probe and request detach, which were added um, afterwards um, when I was starting I, iSCSI, that they are still not documented at the moment. Um, so 
all this was done for iSCSI D, um, and now the question is why? Why do we need an iSCSI initiator? It has something that some people request from time to time. Um, it is not so that we are the first to do an iSCSI initiator. I think we're actually fairly late in the game. Um, FreeBSD already has one. They they wrote everything. Uh, they do everything in the kernel, so they have a kernel module that has all the initiator code in them. Uh, NetBSD has a user line initiator that uses their fuse, refuse, or whatever they call it now interface, which does the uh, uh, user line file system um, support. In the end, um, we think we can do better. In our terms of better, we have different goals, and uh, our goals, I think, is we want a simple implementation and we want more security. Um, we don't want to have a lot of code in the kernel, which runs at uh, even more than super user privileges, and we don't want to have a daemon that runs all the time in super user or, or with with, uh, with super user privileges. So uh, for us, it's important to have privilege dropping or privilege separation in such a daemon and uh, not everything in the kernel. And I think we also suffer a little bit from not invented here syndrome. Um, or at least I do. <laughs> in the end, um, it is not another BGPD or OSPFD. It's something different, uh, even though I, I, I wrote most code of these two things and they got cloned into so many other programs that uh, there are uh, some people actually ex uh, expect that everything that we knew started is, is, is done the same way, but um, iSCSI D uh, is not using iMessages. Um, but it has a control socket and it has a control program, so there is a nice SCSI CTL. Um, the good thing is we actually don't need privilege separation because we just can change root and privilege drop um, since the, the only thing that needs um, privileges is to actually open the, the vSCSI interface or device node and after that we don't need any super user um, privileges. Then um, iSCSI doesn't really use DNS or any, uh, any other thing that normally fails to work in change root environments. So uh, because of this we, we, we just can't change root and leave it there and, and have a very simple um, daemon running all the time. Um, one also very special thing is that we decided to uh, not have a, a parser inside the daemon that parses the configuration and boot up but instead use the uh, CTL program to do the configuration parsing and sending the configuration down to the, uh, the, the daemon. So at the beginning you start up and you run the, the daemon without configuration and it waits there until it gets configured. Um, now this is this is probably the most important sc slide. Um, vSCSI is making iSCSI D very simple. It actually makes it so simple that I can actually write it. I have no idea about SCSI, um, and still I was able to to write a daemon that actually more or less works in something like three days um, with a lot of hacks. But it, it started to 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 pass data back and forth. To, to a target, and um, it was it was very very funny because uh, I thought I had to do I had to know a lot about SCSI to, to be able to to get to that point. Like, how how do I attach a disk, or how, uh, how do I have to interpret like the SCSI commands that that are passed over it to to know what's going on and stuff like this? But in the end, they're just all black boxes. I'm just moving data back and forth and. I, I don't care what's what's in them. Like when there is an error, okay, there there is there is sense data in in, in the response message from from uh, in the SCSI response message, and they just pack it into the into the target to initiator IOCTL with with the data and 
let the kernel know and the kernel will then figure out what's going on and, and try to re recover from it. So for, for iSCSI D, um, SCSI is, is, a, is a black box. And but the other amazing thing is that the, the, the vSCSI implementation in the kernel is something like 600 lines of code. So it's very, very, very simple. And um, the, the iSCSI D implementation in userland is, uh, is it's a couple of thousand lines of code. So all in all, this, this is very, very small program that implements uh, a rather complex protocol from the outside. Um, so iSCSI D itself is responsible only to do like the session and connection um, management. So running the finite state machines there, trying to get the connection up and running, authentication, um, doing the negotiation with the other side, trying to figure out what I'm actually allowed to send them and when the, the target will actually not like what I'm sending. Um, it just packs and unpacks the SCADIS messages that we get from vSCSI into, into PDUs, uh, sends them over the network, gets the response back, unpacks them, sends them back to the, to the, to the kernel, and, and moves on like this. So this is fairly simple. Um, all in all, it's mostly a buffer management thing. So um, we have these protocol data units, and in iSCSI they're Structured, they start with a with a fixed header, and then they have like optional data and everything. Um, because of this, I, I decided to try to mimic this idea of having like a a fixed header and then sub data connected to it into the buffer management. Um, the idea behind this is that we want not that that we try to avoid unnecessary copying of data around um, and in the end hopefully results into a simplified data management. Um, this comes from the fact that we're using libevent and as in OSPF D and in, in, in other daemons that use libevent, um, I tend to avoid the buffering code from libevent that is provided by libevent because every time I try to use it, I figure out it's just not what I need. Um, the the libevent buffer buffering system is very good for streams that are unstructured, but I just all the times I'm using it, I having structured data, and and I need to to um, to do a like I can use the buffer events, but when I'm using it on writes. I need to actually add on top of the buffer event, like the, the, the buffer event from libevent, I need to add another uh, buffering layer where I have to uh, parse and extract the, the buffers that libevent is, is, is giving me and, and put them into new buffers. And, and this makes somewhat like a clumsy interface. So I tend to just write them directly. Um, this is what I came up with. Um, so the iSCSI wire format starts with the with the basic header segment where um, most information is stored in it. There are sometimes some additional headers. Um, in our implementation, we actually don't need them, but they can happen. Um, there is possibility to have digests or CSC checksums of the header segment or the data segments which are also optional, and um, depending on the command, there is data connected to them or not. So what we, what I do is uh, I allocate uh, a PDU and use something like the the I/O vectors from from Litfo and from our vectorized I/Os um, to put this data into into it, their own segments, and uh, then I can directly access them and. and um, figure out what's going, um, like where the data is, and and just have the data in one segment. So um, in iSCSI D, the the workflow is is um, very simple. So most transfers are actually started by the initiator. Um, for iSCSI D, that means actually that most uh, transfers start with the I2T message from vSCSI and um, 
the uh, after this event, we just create a PDU PDU buffer. We put everything together into this buffer and schedule this buffer then onto a task, and the task is sent over the connection, and we're waiting for a response. So. This is more or less how it, how it looks. So at the beginning, we started with an IO event. We, we get woken up from poll or KQ or whatever you're using. Um, this is, this is uh, hidden by the event. Um, we get the event. We do the VSCSI I2T. Um, now we see, oh, OK, it's a read operation, because this example is for a read operation. We create the PDU. We queue the task. We schedule the task. Um, then this task is sent over the, the wire as uh, iSCSI SCSI request to the target. The target is preparing the transfer um, and then starts to sending us the data back in, in the SCSI data in um, messages. It can be a single one or it can be multiple ones. Um, here I just assume that there are multiple ones. Then our task handler um, is getting these data in um, and based on the on, on the information it gets like it's a SCSI data in so I can actually <coughs> use the data that is in there and send it to, to the kernel with the vSCSI data read IOCTL and it does that until it gets the SCSI response which uh, terminates the, the transfer and in that case uh, it issues the, the vSCSI target to initiator uh, IOCTL and closes the task, and, and after that, everything is finished. The write operation is a little bit more complex because um, we actually want to get data out. Um, so the, the the problem there is that at the beginning, it's the same thing. We, we get the, 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 the command, we queue the task, we schedule the task, we send it to the target, and then the target actually has to tell us, OK, I'm ready, so you can start sending me the data. So we get uh, a special ready to transfer message. And based on that one, we're then um, doing the, the right IOCTL, get data, create a PDU, send that PDU out to the other side, and every time uh, the target is sending us ready to transfer again, we, we do one right after the other until we wrote all data or the transaction was actually aborted beforehand. So again, in the end, we get the SCSI response, um, which closes the task and closes the transaction. Um, future work, um, at the moment the, the code is outside of the OpenBSD tree, um, it needs a lot of cleanup and a couple of features added to it. Um, my target is to bring it into the tree after the unlock, which is going to be very soon, but um, I have them like six months time to get it in. <laughs> um, then one big goal is to make it actually work, even so it already does, sort of. Um, we, I'm, I'm just like hard-coded a lot of things and assumptions, and uh, currently it works against the NetBSD target, um, but it seems the NetBSD target has some strange ideas how the protocol is implemented. Uh, it, does more or less the same thing as we do. They just implement parts of it. And at the beginning, I was using other parts of it. So I was talking to, to the target, and the target was just not responding as I expected it. Uh, it took some while until I figured out what the, the right way of talking to the NetBSD target is. And uh, after that, that was actually working. But um, it's not said that we can actually use the same code to talk to another target because they may have other idea of, of, of how they want to actually uh, do the transactions. Um, very future work is to actually move parts of the um, processing back into the kernel. Uh, if we realize that the performance is not good enough, um, the idea is that we could hook the 
the v the the the, the the viscosity part into into the kernel, so creating the, the 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 command, sending that out of the socket, try to do that for the viscosity and and the the SCSI request, SCSI response, and the data in data out commands directly in the kernel, and um, doing everything else that the kernel does not understand or that the kernel actually does not want to handle up into user land, and um, then there is this other thing that people really like to use with iSCSI, that's RDMA, um, which is a very scary concept. And uh, I'm not even sure if we if we gonna ever go into that direction, but it's surely something we I want to may have a look at um, how how can it be done, and it only makes sense to to look into into remote DMA. Uh, in the case where we already are running inside the kernel with a larger part of, of our code. Um, yes, this is um, more or less the last slide. I want to thank to Hiroki Sato and all others uh, organizing AGVSDCon. It's a very nice conference to come to and I try to come every year, so uh, this is now my third time and I really like it here. Um, I want to de de thank David Gwynn, who is not here this time because of baby problems. <laughs> uh, he just got fa uh, father. Um, for doing VSCSI and forcing me to write iSCSI D, um, he always came to me and said, ah, I, I don't know, it's user land, I don't work user land, I, it's too complex. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so he forced me to write it. And um, I want to thank Mark, Brian, Mathieu, and all others from OpenBSD for all their help and for the sushi here in, <laughs> in Tokyo. <laughs> so, any questions? Did you yep. test your implementation against these commodity masses that now have also iSCSI as? Checklist item feature. Um, I, I Linux implementation of it because what's on the NAS? Yeah. The, there is a plan at the moment. Uh, I don't really have access to one of these devices. I put a request for them onto our one page. Um, I actually want to have, like, I, I need some access to multiple devices, like real iSCSI, like enterprise, enterprise style systems. And then like the the, 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 the cheap NAS stuff um, to test against. Uh, currently, I'm only tested against the, the NetBSD target. This also comes from the fact that the 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 I have access to a very simple uh, like, like a small NAS, but that one actually wants to always use a password, and I haven't implemented the chop exchange at the moment. So. I have a few questions. Yeah. So, okay. First one: Is it reasonable to use it on a, a high latency link, like across the internet, or is that a silly idea? Um, I think it's a silly idea. But just check. It. It's depends what you want to do because, like, disks are slow. Yeah. So it depends what high latency is. If high latency is from Japan to Europe, which is two hundred milliseconds, then. Um, you will not get a lot of performance out That's, of that. Yeah. We, we've dealt with them before, they're called USB floppy drives. Yeah, <laughs> USB floppy drives. They're about the same distance as latency to Japan. Mm. <laughs> or you could, uh, Theo, you could, you could use that, that idea from the rate controller we saw with the eight SDIOs. Uh, yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. SD cards. Yeah, Instead of that, you just could use bio CTL and then rate the, the <laughs> iSCSI the devices into a rate zero to get more performance. Mm. <laughs> some of them local, some of them local. <laughs> yeah. Confident, confident distribution, yeah. redundancy. Yeah. Offside backup. Offside backup, yeah. yeah. Rate six on every conflict. <laughs> <laughs> so that when your, rate, so when, when your disks in Chile suddenly. Crash. It's still okay. <laughs> if it's getting shaken to death, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Another question is: Have you thought about um, doing multiple path stuff so that you have, for example, two IP addresses, two separate network paths to the target, uh, so you can be failover if one fails? Um, this is possible by the protocol. 
because they say uh, you can have a, like you can have multiple connections to the target. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, does the target actually allow it? So most targets are just not capable of doing more than actually one active connection at a time. Okay, because that's the big thing for um, fiber channel SAN yeah, these days. Uh, is so that's different though. That's, that's different. That's a multipath subsystem. That's okay. it's above SCSI. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So we have multiple paths to the same SCSI devices. Ah. Uh, yeah. We recognize that it's, that it's the same device at multiple paths. Okay. Different right. Controller paths. Right. So okay. that's uh, the code that David's working. On. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So in 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 iSCSI you only see a device once, and in Fiber Channel you actually are capable of seeing the device multiple times, and you have right. to figure out. Uh, oh, this is the same device. Oh, this is also right. the same device. Right. Oh, this is also the right. same device. Right. And then right. you, you have the multiple passes right. okay. to fail over to. Any other questions? Uh, related to latency, what's about common queuing in iSCSI uh, only and in your implementation specifically? Um, it's possible to do like tact queuing. Um, the I don't really care. I'm just um, if Vscasi is supporting it, then I'm supporting it because for me, every, I can't support multiple tasks at the same time. Um, interestingly, the the, um, the the iSCSI RFCs is 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 a bit strange about like doing multiple things at the same time. So you can only schedule one task at a time on onto a single connection. Uh, you have to, you cannot interleave like data transfers. So it's, it's a bit strange, you, you, you could run <coughs> multiple commands at the same time, but at the same time there is so many restrictions that in the end you normally end up doing just one after the other. At least that's my feeling at the moment. Any other questions? comments? Then I think I'm finished.